testing for Bartonellosis is very confusing, not only for patients like me and you, but I also see, unfortunately, many doctors not understanding testing for Bartonellosis as well as you might hope. I guarantee that after you watch this video, you will know more about testing for Bartonellosis than many of your doctors. Dare I say most? I don't know. But this will help you be your own best health advocate. Okay, hi Bartonella buddies. I'm here with Dr. Jen Miller and um, I like to let uh, my interviewees uh, introduce themselves. So I'll let you introduce yourself, tell us um, a little bit about your background, how you got to Galaxy, um, and your role in Galaxy. Okay, so my name is Jennifer Miller. I am the Director of Research and Development and also the Assistant Laboratory Director at Galaxy Diagnostics. So my path to Galaxy was, was sort of um, long and curvy. I started out in academia as a tenure track professor at North Carolina State University. My background and my training is in vector-borne infectious diseases, primarily Borrelia burgdorferi. I was trained in both the pathogenesis and the host immune response to Borrelia. Um, I have over 22 years of experience with Borrelia and I was recruited to Galaxy initially uh, to start up an R&D division um, and also to focus on Lyme testing initiatives. And then from there branched out of course into Bartonellosis initiatives, because as most of you know, our, our company is very passionate about um, Bartonella testing. Awesome. And I wanted to get right into the new digital uh, ePCR. For those of the, my viewers who don't know what PCR is, I do have previous videos on that. So I'll put that in the video description box. But briefly, I'm going to give a lay person's explanation, and then you can tell me if I get it wrong or add anything. So PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction, and it's a method by which uh, you can amplify what you're trying to target. So uh, Bartonella DNA, for example, um, by uh, healing it up and pulling the DNA uh, apart, and then uh, you add the nucleotides in, and then they uh, attach to the DNA that you've pulled apart and doing that over and over and over until you can detect it. Is that a good, That's a good explanation? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And then um, the E and EPCR stands for enrichment, and that refers to Galaxy's patented VAPGM. It is like a growth medium that um, instead of like mammalian growth medium, it's an insect growth medium, and that helps uh, help the Bartonella grow better. So is that good? Yeah, so it's pretty good. So basically, <laughs> way, one way to look at it is it was the best food source or vitamin source for Bartonella compared to other types of, of growth medium that are used in other types of scientific studies. Cool. And then, so the digital PCR, um, how about you explain how that's different than the old ePCR? Sure. So the old ePCR combined BAPGM with what we call qPCR or quantitative PCR, okay, which works very much like uh, Jake just described. Digital ePCR is very similar in the sense that we're pairing BAPGM, but instead of qPCR, the detection method is called digital or droplet digital PCR. The reason it's called that is it's a different type of PCR that basically takes one PCR reaction and breaks it into 20,000 different PCR reactions. And the way it does that is it basically emulsify, emulsifies it in oil droplets. And the reason that that's important is you are enriching the sample by partitioning it. So one of the big drawbacks to PCR is PCR is very prone to inhibitors or substances that prevent that reaction Jake described from performing at its most and highest efficiency. And inhibitors can be things like blood, hemoglobin, which is a component of blood that's got iron in it. It can be just, you know, host DNA in general that's present in a lot more abundance than Bartonella DNA. Um, think of it as the needle in the haystack. If you've got too much hay, you can't find the needle. What droplet or digital PCR does when it, when it emulsifies that reaction and it breaks it apart, 
is you are segregating away the inhibitors. So what this does is it ups the potential for amplifying the target of interest, in this case, Bartonella. And then you've upped your probability because you've partitioned away what could be inhibiting, and you've also taken one reaction and made 20,000. So for something that's extraordinarily low yield and hard to find like Bartonella, you're also reducing your sampling bias because you've, you, you, you may have a piece of that needle in, in an oil droplet that, that a regular PCR would miss. And by looking at all 20,000 reactions at the same time, statistically, you've upped your chances of finding Bartonella. And then with the digital PCR, so you'd have a contrived sample versus a clinical sample. And a clinical sample might be from someone who uh, is ill with uh, a Bartonella infection. And then a contrived sample or spiked sample is uh, you take human blood and then you put in uh, the pathogen into the human blood. So it's contrived in the sense that you're, you're mocking a clinical sample, right? Mm -hmm. So you hear the words contrived and mock and spiked, sort of used interchangeably by scientists, and they're often used interchangeably in the literature. Okay. And not like spiked punch. <laughs> no, not like that. No. <laughs> uh, uh, a little less fun. Um, so when you put the Bartonella into the contrived sample, you try to mock what you believe to be the bio burden, like in a person who's sick with Bartonella. So you um, want to do that. But remember, if you're analytically validating, you're going to spike a lot of different values because you want to test, the, you want the assay to flex its muscles. Yeah. So you're going to do what we call a curve, okay? And this is borrowed from statistics or math or even microbiology, where you're going to spike a varying series of, of concentrations that are often dilutions. Often in PCR, it's easy to use factors of 10 just because it's easy math, right? Mm -hmm. That works well with bacteria, which, which divide and multiply logarithmically, and you can track that by factors of 10. So you'll, so generally, if you're going to do it right, you'll spike, so to speak, with a variety of concentrations. You'll spike high, which isn't physiological for patients, but it allows you to kind of say, wow, if my assay doesn't even work at this level, how is it going to work at the physiological level? Yeah. And then you go down, right? And part of the reason you go down is you want to be able to, to define the levels and the limits of detection of the assay. With the study, did you then, did you go to what, like a physiological or clinically relevant level? Yes. Yeah, so, so Ricardo did a, a, a variety of dilutions. He started out at something that would be high, and then he went all the way down to what would amount to um, fractional amounts of Bartonella. In other words, really, really small numbers. So his assay was able to detect, you know, down to half a copy of Bartonella and he went lower than that. And that was how he knew that's where the detection was because he went lower and then you lose the sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So yes, he went, he went very, very low and um, down to, you know, like I said, fractional amounts of, of Bartonella that would be present because of course in a clinical sample, you might have, you know, 10 mLs of blood and, you know, there might be one Bartonella, two Bartonella. I mean, this is why Bartonella is so hard to detect and, and mm -hmm. find. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that sounds great though, that it can detect it that low and it makes sense with galaxy slogan Go, going beyond the limits of detection. Is that your guys' slogan? Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's our new slogan. I agree. Yes. <laughs> In that study. So that was, um, that was a study funded by the NIH and cool. the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. That's exciting because I know it's not easy to get grants for study. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to get NIH to understand the importance of Bartonella, but we're working on it. Thank you. <laughs> when you did that study, you went to your biobank of samples. And so you got 112 samples from 38 patients uh, with that had suspected Bartonellosis. So I guess one question I have is, um, how did you suspect, oh, there's a bug that flew by. How, how did you suspect that they had Bartonellosis? So a lot of them were 
referred based upon their physician, based upon risk factors and symptoms. And a lot of the, the patients had been previously tested either by IFA and or uh, EPCR. Mm -hmm. So we had a couple different um, metrics for eval evaluating suspected Bartonellosis. The old qPCR had six out of 112 positives, while the digital ePCR had 52 out of 112. So that is a huge uh, difference in sensitivity. I think, though, if uh, patients were to read this study, and even many doctors were to read this study, they might look at 52 out of 112 and be like, oh, it has like 50% uh, sensitivity. So why is it not that simple? So this is an excellent point. Okay. So here, so the answer is there's more than more than one reason, but we'll start basic. So the first is that this was a proof of concept or in some ways, a clinical utility study, not a clinical validation study. So why is the difference important? It comes down to well, how well characterized your samples are. And you set that up quite nicely by the first question you asked me, which was, how did we know? Notice I did not tell you that we had six patients with acute cat scratch disease and six patients with documented bacillary angiomitosis, okay? We had what I call real life samples, people whose physicians had, had said, hey, I, I suspect Bartonellosis, I'm going to do some testing. Mm -hmm. So it, got, it comes down to you can't define sensitivity and specificity correctly if you don't know what your denominator is. So we don't have a well-described, characterized clinical population. And so that's why calculating that as a sensitivity isn't really a fair metric because then the follow-up question is, okay, sensitivity based upon what? Based upon which population? And this is a very, very important point. A lot of your audience is going to be familiar with Lyme disease and with the battle to try and get better testing for that particular condition. Mm -hmm. And Bartonella and Borrelia, Borreliosis can be very, very, very different diseases. But I'll say this for Borreliosis. The Borrelia has gotten to the point where they have developed biobanks of well-characterized clinical samples. Those are the types of samples that you use in a clinical validation. So what do I mean by that? The CDC and the NIH have panels of serum that you can get for validation studies, and those samples are well-defined. You know that these six patients have rheumatoid factor. You know that these 12 patients have acute Lyme disease with a bullseye rash, and they were PCR positive X number of times. That's how you define sensitivity and specificity. You have to have a really well-defined denominator. So with our study, we wanted to take a look at the combined Galaxy and NC State biorepositories and, and ask out of real life patient samples where it really is ambiguous. And, and our, our patients are mostly chronic Bartonella patients. Well, many of chronic Bartonella patients can tell you way better than I can that there's no real clinical definition of chronic Bartonellosis. And you're simply asking, does my new assay, does it, does it have the ability to detect anything in these patients mm -hmm. better than whatever I'm comparing it to? Mm -hmm. and, and so and it looks like a validation in the sense that you're comparing it to something else, but your sample population isn't well-defined. Yes. So I could imagine one could design um, a study where um, you have people with HIV or AIDS, and they have a compromised immune system. And so maybe they have a higher uh, bio burden in their blood. Right. And so then you take uh, uh, 50 HIV AIDS patients with Bartonella and you run your uh, digital EPCR, or whatever else, and you find, oh, well, we got it in all 50 patients. Well, those patients have a higher bio burden. Right. With your Bartonellosis patients, uh, their uh, bio burden is probably lower. And then um, when you don't know the denominator, it's because you don't know for sure they have 
Bartonellosis sometimes. Right. It's very right? hard to define and you've got so many different presentations. Yeah. And so I did read um, a paper. They were creating a an assay for Bartonella endocarditis and they tested it against like uh, cat scratch disease patients and maybe probably a control group. And the, so you can develop an assay for Bartonella endocarditis that performs very well for that, that doesn't perform well for cat scratch disease. So a test for Bartonella is going to perform differently on different types of presentations, whether that be acute cat scratch disease, endocarditis, and then within Bartonellosis, we don't, we haven't gotten there. I don't think scientifically, uh, neurobartonellosis, uh, people with POTS or, uh, autoimmune disease component, one Bartonella test can perform better in different types of And again, population. you know, I, I think it helps for the audience sometimes too. And, and I'm cheating because it's, it's my training, but again, think about, think about Lyme Borreliosis. Acute Lyme disease is not the same as chronic or post-treatment Lyme disease. It's not the same as Lyme arthritis. It's not the same as neuroborreliosis. You know, and that, that, that field is, is evolving to understand that. And I, and I think you have to take something like Bartonella, which has even more potential clinical complications and symptoms and manifestations associated with it and apply the same logic. Yep. And so that goes into clinical val- uh, clinical sensitivity versus analytical sensitivity. And so you said in your um, presentation at Dr. Schickman's um, conference that most labs are quoting you uh, their, their analytical sensitivity. So if I was a lab, I could uh, make contrived samples that have um, a very large uh, burden of bacteria in them and then be like, oh, my test has 99% sensitivity because it picked it up in all of these contrived samples. So I can I can legally say that, and it could have no relevance to um, what it looks like out in the real world. And the reason it's legal, and I want to make this point, because a lot of labs are trying their best to do what they can for the patients. But look at it this way. If you're trying to validate an assay, and you want well-characterized clinical samples, how are you going to get those samples? How are you going to get them? And I'm, and I'm not being, I'm not being arrogant. It's a legitimate question. I mean, you can't get the samples. There's no biobanks. There's no NIH funded research to establish Bart, Bartonella biobanks. So even if you say, okay, I want to study chronic Bartonellosis. Okay. Which condition, which manifestation? What type of patient population would you like to look at? You know, so it's very difficult. So I always tell providers when they call me and they say to me, gee, I'd really like to know how your assay is going to perform in my neuropsychiatric patients. I say, well, I would really like to know that too. If you have samples, you know, that you would like to, if you'd like to partner with us and, you know, we can do a research study and work together to understand how our assay works with your patient population. And I would love to do that. And I would love to be able to have that information and to publish it in a peer reviewed journal, because I'm sure that if you want to know your peers do too, it's a long road to get there. You know, you have to do a lot of research, um, a lot of repetition, a lot of um, publication, a lot of um, educating, and it, and it takes money. It takes a lot of money, a lot of resources, you know, my colleagues at NC State have, have spent a lot of time, you know, recently studying neurobartonellosis and, and, you know, what I would call cutaneous or skin manifestations of bartonellosis and trying to figure out, you know, how well our tests work on those particular conditions. And, you know, and from that can come other new novel tests that, that maybe can be directed. And part of the reason that more of these studies aren't done, too, is that they're expensive. Yeah. You know, we have to try to, that's where grant funding and other things come in and we have to try to raise money to do these studies. Yeah. That's the other thing, you know, advocate for, advocate for Bartonella research, you know, tell your, your congressperson that, that, that Bartonella is important. Imagine if there were NIH funded studies for Bartonella. Imagine if the CDC investigated 
you know, chronic Bartonellosis, you know, they know a fair bit about acute scat scratch disease, right? But imagine if they had the resources financially to, to build a biorepository for acute scat scratch disease or even chronic Bartonellosis, like they were able to for Lyme disease because they had federal funding. Yeah. And I would just say, you know, if you're going to advocate, uh, do it in a um, polite way and not an attacking way, because um, you don't want to burn bridges. With no, that. no, you definitely want to be polite, but, you know, but, but certainly if we're being practical, there's a lack of samples and a lack of access, but what causes lack of samples and lack of access? Lack of money, right? <laughs> it goes hand in hand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One thing that I found uh, interesting was in that study on the digital ePCR, did you find that those were, who were positive on IFA were negative on digital ePCR? So I'll answer the question this way. So there have been studies in the literature uh, done by our colleagues at NC State, but other researchers as well around the world, where you can have situations where someone is IFA reactive for Bartonella and let's say PCR, EPCR negative, but you can also have the reverse situation mm-hmm. where somebody is PCR positive and IFA negative. Mm-hmm. So the reasons for that are, are complicated. Uh, they, may re- they may relate to the difference in immune status of a host, but um, uh, the disease state or the manifestation um, that the person is in can matter. The sample type being tested can matter. You know, what you're seeing in blood versus maybe what you're seeing in in a tissue or a fluid. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? So we know that Bartonella are stealth, low yield pathogens. We know they cycle into and out of the bloodstream. And because of that, they can be very difficult to detect. Maybe they're in the tissue. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, testing of tissue can be helpful. Right. And that, and sometimes when one reports on positive PCR results versus IFA, the IFA is being done of the serum, which is obtained from the blood. But there have been studies, you know, certainly Dr. Breishward has published some, there's other researchers as well, where PCR positives were obtained from tissue. Think about, you know, PCR positives coming from skin stria, for example. Another way of looking at it is that Bartonella, because they're stealth pathogen, they don't always want to elicit an immune response. So if you're hiding out and you're growing inside red blood cells, or if you're Bartonella, heck, you're growing in every cell type imaginable, right? You don't want to attract the attention of the immune system. So if you don't want to attract the attention of the immune system, you might trick the immune system so that it doesn't make antibodies, Mm -hmm. in which case you have a negative IFA. But if you've got you know, an acute infection where like, like acute scratch, scratch disease, but before you've got swollen lymph nodes, one might be able to pick that up by PCR because the bacteria are there, but you haven't made an antibody response yet. Maybe it's because the pathogen is suppressing the immune response, or maybe it's because in the case of acute, acute, bit, bit, that, in the case of acute cat scratch disease, you're showing symptoms before your body's had time to make antibodies. And that mm-hmm. can happen. To. Another thing is that if, if patients are being treated for other conditions, or even if they're being treated for Bartonella and they're on drugs that might be immunosuppressive in some ways, like corticosteroids or other treatments, that may suppress your ability to mount an antibody response, but it might cause bacteria that are hiding to either come out of the tissues and be more detected. And so then for the reverse, when you get antibodies and not uh, DNA, as a lay person, I could imagine that perhaps the immune system is keeping the bio burden lower. That can um, certainly happen. Do you have any other yeah. sort of, do you have any sure. sort of speculation or sure. so let's, so let's, also, is this all, um, is this all speculation or do, has, have you guys published on this? So a lot of it is based upon uh, theories of immunology, theories from other pathogens. Um, Galaxy has done some work um, looking definitely in, in our animal friends, right? Because we're a one health company. Uh, NC State has published some studies looking at the relationship between various testing modalities of, of dogs. So Erin Lashnitz recently published a paper where she compared 
IFA and, and various PCR modalities when she was looking at dogs with hemangiosarcoma and she compared those techniques and she saw what we were just describing. You'd have different tests picking up different pathologies just within these dogs. Mm-hmm. So something else to think about, and, and I don't think that this is known for Bartonella, but we, we know that we talked about immune status of patients, you know, maybe varying. So it's known, for example, that patients with chronic Lyme disease maybe don't make an antibody response, or maybe they only make IgM antibodies and they don't change from IgM to IgG. Mm -hmm. That can cause, depending upon the tests that you're looking at, different results. And so I don't know that anybody's ever looked at that with Bartonella. Mm -hmm. And so that's why Galaxy recommends a panel approach. The way you put it as a panel is, is not a bad way in the sense that it's good to combine what we would call indirect testing or something that maybe is antibody based like an IFA with something that's more direct or molecular testing like a digital ePCR, because then you're kind of coming at the problem from both angles. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you know, we have patients that are, that are quite ill that, that neither technique yields an answer, you know, and that's, that's something where, you know, we need to continue to work towards figuring out what that is. And we need to continue to pursue new technologies that, that, you know, try to enrich a sample. I want to talk about why patients get so many different results. So as a um, admin of a Facebook group, and then I've also, when I wasn't an an admin, I spent a lot of time on the (laughs) Facebook groups and people would post their um, results from various labs, whether that be boutique or specialty labs or big labs and get very different results, even with the same types of tests, maybe get a positive IFA IFA at one uh, lab and a negative IFA at another. And so it just, as a patient has made me wonder, you know, CLIA is the oversight, uh, like what do they do? And if CLIA is providing oversight, I would expect as a patient just for the test results to be less disparate between so labs, but the they, yeah. Here's the deal. This is very important. CLIA doesn't regulate tests. CLIA regulates services. Okay. So one way to look at it, okay, and this is very important, is you have multiple agencies that oversee laboratory testing in the United States. So FDA, which everybody's heard of, the FDA regulates tests, okay, and kits and, and equipment. The CDC makes testing, makes clinical recommendations based upon the FDA, okay? The job of CLIA is to regulate laboratory services, and so that's an important distinction. So CLIA is the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments Act. The point of CLIA is to ensure accuracy, reliability, and timeliness of test results within a given lab. Okay, so so what that means is that the goal of CLIA is to make sure that within an individual laboratory, the people running the assay are getting accurate results, okay, and that there's there's precision. So in other words, if two different people are running the test within the same lab, they should be able to run it with the same results, Mm -hmm. okay? So the reason that, that tests and results can differ between laboratories okay, is that laboratories are not running the same exact tests. It may seem that way to the provider and the patient, but an IFA run in one lab is not necessarily the identical to an IFA run in another lab, okay? You have different, basically the tests can be different. So an IFA, well, the type of cell that the lab is using for the assay can differ. The type of Bartonella that the lab is using can differ where they buy their antibodies from that turn the Bartonella green can vary from company to company, how they use those antibodies. In other words, the exact protocols that they follow can be different. This is why even in the scientific literature, you can take two groups of people doing similar experiments, they get slightly different results and you'll read a sentence in the paper that says, well, we're not exactly sure why these results differ, but different protocols, methods and interpretations were used. Mm-hmm. It sounds like that's a cop out, but it's really not because how you run the assay and what you use can be different. 
right? So that can affect things. The other thing that can differ is what I just hinted at and what I just said, and that's interpretation. So let's use IFA, for example. So a lot of labs are used to running IFA for acute cat scratch disease because that was the test for which the IFA was the standard of care. Well, acute cat scratch disease has a higher bio burden of Bartonella. And so your threshold for positivity is going to be different. Mm -hmm. So in other words, maybe you need a higher titer. Maybe you, in, in those titers vary, but maybe you need something like a, a 1 to 256 or a 1 to 512. That's because you're dealing with an acute high bio burden infection. Other labs, I'll use us as an example, we aren't seeing cat scratch disease samples. We're seeing chronic Bartonellosis samples for which there are no standards. And so we have established our IFA cutoffs to be different based upon scientific literature of other people that have run IFAs for chronic Bartonellosis and what they have seen. And so you can have different cutoff or different interpretation criteria from lab to lab. And I understand this is very frustrating for patients. It's also frustrating for providers because it's difficult to tell between labs, you know, what you're dealing with. And so what I always tell people is I can't comment on other labs assays because I don't know how they're running their assays. And that's true. You know, all I can comment on is, is what we're doing. So at one point you said, you know, CLIA overlooks like accuracy, but uh, accuracy to, to the layperson is different than accuracy with what you're talking about. You mean accuracy like over time within that lab, not accuracy right. Right. as, as uh, it's accurate in determining who has Bartonellosis. Well, because, because again, to determine who has Bartonellosis, you'd have to know that the person has Bartonellosis. What kind of Bartonellosis do they have? And so, yes, accuracy is if the test is run, X number of days, do you get the same result on each day? And then the other thing with uh, CLIA is like labs, and I've talked about this with the man on my channel, labs don't have to publish anything at all. And no, so, no. and so we, I talk a lot and also just to patients about lab transparency. And so the only way to know what's going on behind a lab's closed doors is if they publish. And if they don't publish, you have no idea really what they're doing and they don't have to, they don't have to tell you. Um, so yeah, I just, I hammer that home that lab transparency yeah, so is not the name of the game. And I, I find galaxy to be the exception to that rule. So what we try to do is at every step of the way, we try to publish. We had a new assay. We, we tested it on some samples and, and we got that information out there so that other people could have it, but we don't plan on stopping there. And I think that you're going to find that for Bartonellosis, as for a lot of other diseases, that, that there may not be one test that does everything. And I know that providers really, really want that. Patients really, really want it. But it's hard because you've got a you know, chronic stealth pathogen that causes such a diverse range of diseases. You know, you may need a lot of different tests. And, and one of the things that providers always tell me is that you know, they're trying to figure out how to use all of the tests that are in their arsenal, you know, which test is good for this and which test is good for that, you know, and even that's a struggle because we don't, we don't know enough about clinical utility. And the only way to learn about clinical utility is to, you know, get the funding and do the studies and, and as you said, publish them. Yeah. And I definitely. think you have to learn from what everybody is doing. You know, everybody, you know, somebody will say to me, well, I talked to so-and-so at this lab and they're doing this and they said that. And my response is always, that's great. I would love for them to publish that observation. I yeah. want to learn. I want to know, you know? Yeah, and I, I always say um, also to patients, like if something flies in the face of the published literature, there, there's two things that, ha that are happening. Something novel they've discovered, which should be published so that we can further our understanding of Bartonella or something's not quite right with that test. And so, so I, I sometimes wonder about patients and doctors want a positive test for many reasons. They want to be validated for why they're ill. Uh, they don't want to be bombarded with a heavy duty antibiotic protocol without knowing that, you know, that's, they're dealing with a chronic infection. At the same time, you don't go testing at every lab, hoping that you get a positive to fulfill like 
what you want as a patient or as a doctor. So, you know, that's why publishing is important so that other scientists and experts in the field can look at what you're doing and make sure it's, it's sound. Well, and we're learning so much about what makes an individual not feel well. You know, you can have a, a, a pathogen affect you, and that's certainly true, but the pathogen alters so much more. You know, the, the path, your, your immune response. function changes, your microbiome changes, you know, you, yeah. your diet changes. You find that you can't, you have to completely live a different way. Yeah. And, and yes, it may be that that started from the bacteria. That's a hundred percent true. But sometimes even after you've had treatment, you know, something is still wrong. And so I, I think we're still learning about the interplay between the pathogen the and, and the host and the yeah. host and, and, and we're all different. I mean, yeah. our colleagues that are doing nutritional and immune function studies, you know, I want to see what they're publishing too, because, you know, and there are people out there that, that are chronically ill and, and maybe Barnella is not what they have. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I want them, I want them to know what they have. And the more that's in the literature that helps us understand the complexity of the problem because it is complex. Anybody that thinks being chronically ill is simple has never been chronically ill. Mm -hmm. So back to the confusing part of the science. Uh, when you do PCR, you do um, and you get a positive hit. You send it out to be sequenced. So um, you sequence PCR as long as it's able to be sequenced, mm -hmm. and you have to have enough. Yeah, you have to have enough and DDPCR can't be sequenced because right now there's not a method because it's in the oil. Okay. Okay. So you want to sequence when you can, because the more uh, knowledge is power. My kids tell me that I, I sound corny or like a fortune cookie, but it's true. <laughs> knowledge is power. Okay. And so I want to talk about, and I know you're going there, but I have, I'm going to go there too. The difference between genus and species. And I want to make a point because there's a lot of information out there that, that you must go species specific for the information to be useful. And I don't think that that's true. I think that you can learn a lot from genus level PCRs, okay? But there's caveats. Those, those PCRs have to be well controlled, but gen genus level can be important because you don't want to miss anything. Species specific is, is good if there's a specific treatment protocol, you know, where people get into trouble with genus level PCRs is if they pick the wrong target. That's when you can get something that's not specific. Yeah. So I've read a publication by Dr. Breitschwer and Dr. Maggi. They looked at uh, genus specific PCR or what they thought was genus specific PCR for Bartonella. And mm -hmm. they did it on molecular grade water, which is water that's you know, used in the lab and it's supposed to be sterile and they amplified, you know, something with that, uh, method and it turned out to not be Bartonella and it was like meso I don't know. Uh, I'll put it up on the screen and, uh, editing, uh, species. So that just shows you that like, you can get false positives with PCR if the, but, test but Jake, you can get false positives with anything. <laughs> Meaning, meaning that no test is bulletproof. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're going to get, and this is why it's important to validate and to do clinical utility. Mm -hmm. If somebody tells you that something is a hundred percent, I want to see the data. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> I mean, it happens, and, and that's why you sequence, and that's why you can take something like that that happens, and you can sequence, and you can go back. And you can refine your methodology, right? You can go back and you can say, okay, um, that picked that up. I wasn't expecting that. I'm glad I found it by sequencing. You can go back and you can say, okay, I can refine my methodology. When you were sequencing, like with, uh, before the digital PCR, what species came up the most often? And do you have hypotheses on why those are the most, spe most common species? I mean, Hensley, you would expect to be one of the most common because so, of exposure. It all comes back to your patient population, right? 
Mm -hmm. So things that, that we, and I, and by we, I, I include our colleagues at NC State collectively yeah. because they see a lot wider, okay? So obviously Henselay, uh, we see Martin Ella and Sony I quite frequently. Um, mm -hmm. Bartonella cholera is more common than people might think. Mm -hmm. So I think it has to do with patient population. Again, I told you, I don't, I don't see acute cat scratch disease. If I ever got a sample from an acute cat scratch disease patient, I might dance in the hallway because it's something I haven't seen. So I think it has to do with the type of patients that we're seeing, but I also think it has to do with, you know, vector exposure. For example, if, if I was running around the Andes Mountains, I might ample, I might have Bacilliformis, but I'm not, so I don't. Mm -hmm. so I, you know, I think it has to do with the type of condition or patient that we're seeing. We're mostly seeing chronic. I think it has yeah. to do with um, exposure. M you know, yeah. One, I and up tend to be the ones that are carried by multiple different types of vectors. Got it. It's part of how I would answer your question. And we're not talking about veterinarians. Well, but many veterinarians see dogs and cats, but just many humans have or have dogs and or cats. And so the species that you listed, hens like Coleray, those are very cat E. Right. <laughs> and, and so and is so dog. Nice. Found in dogs and people, yeah. and I, you know, Ed keeps finding Vinsonii. Bartonella quintana is often associated with lice infestations and homelessness, and mm -hmm. you know, there might be situations where, if that's the population you're testing, you might see it. Then you've got other ones that are associated with rodents. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't see that because I don't have patients that are submitting that, but you know. I think what strikes me about Bartonella as a vector-borne disease microbiologist, what strikes me with Bartonella is there's so many different vectors in reservoirs. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So diverse. Yep. And they found it even in sea turtles. So <laughs> I've read, you know, older papers by maybe it was like Regnery. Maybe that's his name. Where he says Hensley and Quintana are up to 95% cross-reactive on IFA tests. Um, I didn't know if Galaxy, like how cross-reactive are species on IFA? I think those studies have to be done. I mean, I think there's, there's, there's obviously some cross-reactivity been reported among strains in the literature. We see some, but, you know, it's not complete. It's not like we have patients order our four panel IFA and all four titers are the same. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing that, you know, we haven't, we haven't had our four panel IFA for very long, you know, when mm -hmm. we're continuing to, to track that, that's something I'm very interested in. You know, there's a lot of work to be done in the literature to understand what antigens or proteins, because antigens are proteins of Bartonella, the immune system is making antibodies to. Mm -hmm. So you might reason that there's going to be proteins or antigens that may be in common across species, because this is what we see with other bacteria. And then there may be, you know, maybe there are antigens that are species specific. So I think that, that those studies need to be done. I'm hoping that, that academic colleagues can do, or hey, NIH wants to give me money, I'll do it. You know, and I want people to understand that, that, an IFA and a Western blot are not the same thing. Okay. So why does Galaxy choose to do an IFA instead of a Western blot for Bartonella? Well, we, we had the tools. I mean, NC State's been publishing on these particular IFA lines for, for decades. Mm -hmm. Got it. So we had all that literature. You know, Dr. Breishwood had this, this wonderful resource bank of, of strains. You know, he, it, it's a resource that not a lot of labs have. As it relates to Western blots, I will tell you that Dr. Breischwartz's lab has, has published some on work that they're doing with Western blots. So that's, that's not something that I would rule out. That's just not something we've brought over here yet. Mm -hmm. um, Western blots are a, bit, are a bit of a different deal. You know, it's easier to use recombinant proteins for Western blots because you can spray them onto a, a strip. Mm -hmm. so, prominent proteins have, have pros and cons. I think if you know what you're targeting and 
you know how that elicits a response, I think that can certainly be useful. You know, like I said, not a lot is known about specific antigens in Bartonella responses. And so I would love to know from a published literature standpoint, what those interactions are. I mean, I definitely think they're useful. For example, I keep going back to Lyme disease because that's what I know. You know, we know, we know for Borrelia that, that C6 of VLSE is a wonderful peptide that's recognized by the immune system. It's been well published. It's been well studied. You know, my, my colleague, Monica Embers, her, her mentor, Mario Philippe, published extensively on C6 and VLSE, and we have all that literature, and we know what it does and how it interacts with the immune system. Same can be said for what's been done with, with I call them the other favorite proteins, OSPE and OSPC. You know, we have all of this literature. Mm-hmm. And so I would say for Barnella that, you know, if we have that literature, you know, it, it, it definitely from, it definitely makes, makes sense from the perspective of a Western blot. I just would love to know what those antigens are and, and how they interact with the immune system. I, I would love to see those publications. I think we can learn so much from that. If I'm understanding you correctly, we're saying, you're saying for Western blot, you know, we don't really know at least in the published literature, very much of what the human immune system recognizes on the outside of a Bartonella bacteria. Right. And, and does that vary from species to species? species. Yeah. That's my question. And, and, and I'm not saying that I know the answer. I'm, I'm genuinely curious. I would yeah. love to know. Yeah. And so I think that I, I invite people that, that work in those areas to, to publish that work. I think it would be fabulous because I know that, you know, it, it's certainly been useful in the field of Lyme disease, but I want people to understand that a Western blot and an IFA are not the same thing, mm-hmm. you know, and, and they have different pros and cons. I mean, I think mm-hmm. that, you know, with a Western blot, you are basically trying to decipher a barcode is, is the best way to put it. You, you get an immune response that looks like a grocery store barcode. Yep. You have to interpret that based upon um, controls and the controls are very important. With IFA, you're looking for a fluorescent signal, but it's not a barcode. You know, you're lighting up, you know, something inside the bacteria or on the surface of the bacteria. It, it depends upon how you do the assay. And, you know, you still, it's still a subjective assay, but you're not reading a barcode. You know, you're generally getting what we call a pung tape or a finely defined dot that's a signal. And you still have to have controls. You always have to have controls. All assays have utility. You just have to know how to use them. Yeah. The reason that serology is, is so predominant is in general, it's been around longer because people were doing IFA before there was PCR. Yeah. Okay. And it's cheap. Yeah. And let's, let's just, let's just be honest. Serology is cheap. Yep. You know, with a Western blot also, you know, the controls are so important because you are reading this barcode and you, some things are not specific. I mean, I think of, I don't know a lot about um, Borrelia, but I think of, you know, 41, band 41, like everyone and their mother has band 41. And so, you know, that alone is not indicative necessarily of a Borrelia infection. And so oh, it's true. It's hundred percent true. You have to, you have to know, it's sort of like you have to have the key to the barcode. And it's true that that's, that's very nonspecific and a lot of people make antibodies to it because basically the 41 band is a component of bacteria that is not exclusive to Borrelia. Other bacteria have that component. Yeah. I wanted to give you the opportunity, if there's any myths or misconceptions that we haven't covered yet, that you would want to, you know, set the record straight for uh, doctors and or patients and or the public. I would just say that, that, that with a low yield pathogen like Bartonella, enrichment is important. It can be very easy to miss what you're looking for if, if you don't somehow enrich or partition or trap, whatever word you want to use. And I think that's important. The second thing is when you're thinking about sensitivity and specificity, be, be very careful with how those parameters are defined. I think clinical utility and publication are very important. You know, we have to understand how tests work in various populations and groups. And then I would say that, that right now, 
I find it difficult to believe for Bartonella in particular that, that, that we have a silver bullet test. I think it's important to use all the tools that you have in your arsenal to try to help your patients in the best way that you can. There are merits and drawbacks to every test. No test is, is 100% foolproof. We have to, as an industry, continue to innovate and improve. And what is Galaxy working on right now? So we have a, a direct bucket, we have an indirect bucket, and then I would say that we have a, what I would call a host response bucket. Host assays, host biomarkers that, that can be influenced by what I would generically say is pathogenic insult whether it be Bartonella or some other tick-borne pathogen. And can you give an example of what um, a host immune response test might be? I'll give you a, a clinical old school one. Okay, so when people get their blood drawn and their doctor sends their blood off for panels, one of the um, markers that can be looked at in blood is something called C-reactive protein. Mm -hmm. so that's something that clinicians will measure as an indicative of a reaction to some sort of, um, for lack of a better word, illness or pathogen. Yeah. Another example would be, you know, there's liver enzymes that people look at. Like AST and ALT? Exactly, yes. Yeah. So that's, those are other examples. Okay, so is Gal and Galaxy's working on that or wants Galaxy to work is, on that? Galaxy is interested in, in host response markers that, that may play a role in tick-borne diseases. That's obviously not it. ALT, AST. Those are just examples, but you get what I'm yes, I think, I think you guys don't need to, you know, do that. It's kind of, <laughs> <laughs> that's too basic for you guys. You're too, you're advanced. You're pushing it forward. The last question I have is what do you think Bartonellosis patients have to be hopeful um, in the future about? I think there's a lot of cutting edge tools that are on the horizon. Mm -hmm. tools that are being developed potentially for Bartonellosis specifically. I think there are tools that are being developed for other infections, other pathologies that could easily be leveraged for Bartonellosis. We need to point to the fact that the Cohen Foundation has created a coalition for Bartonellosis and has funded a multifaceted, multi-university team of investigators to pursue a cutting edge findings in Bartonellosis that could be eventually leveraged for better diagnostics. And so I think that that's a great partnership and a great indicator from a very influential uh, philanthropic and scientifically driven organization. They're putting Bartonella on the map. They're going to let other people understand the importance of that. I think the continued explosion of, of Bartonellosis findings in the literature are important. I think that as, as we learn more about the involvement of Bartonellosis and neuropsychiatric conditions, I, I think that, you know, that's going to drive a, a lot of research and it's going to really open things up. And I think that what is unique about Bartonellosis, at, at least in sort of our view of the world, is that a lot of what is learned from Bartonellosis is being learned with the intent of applying it to better diagnostic treatments. Yeah. The Bartonella Consortium is very, very exciting. So that was, I believe, 4.8 million. And that's going to be with uh, Dr. Monica Embers at Tulane, uh, Dr. Haystead at Duke, and then uh, the NC State team. That's right. I know that federal agencies are paying attention. It is my hope that that's going to prompt NIH funding and it's going to prompt mm -hmm. some other you know, organizations to maybe think about that. You know, I'd, I'd like some of the organizations that have been very heavily Lyme focused to maybe think about broadening their, broadening their horizon. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you talking with me today. And I hope my audience has learned about a lot about testing. I know I have, <laughs> I'm sure they have. So, <laughs> so I want to say thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye Bartonella buddies. A huge thank you to Dr. Jennifer Miller and thank you to you for making it all the way to the end. If you're in a position to do so and if you want to support my hard work and advocacy, you can donate to my channel directly through PayPal or Venmo and the links to that will be in the video description box. I also sell my Bartonella Babe merch. 25% goes to the Bartonella Project at the North Carolina State University College of Veterinary Medicine and I have my Etsy store and that's all in the video description box below as well.
don't let Piper outshine you in the fashion department, because, you know, she's already outshining you in the cuteness department. Am I right? Book Bartonella!